hello lovely kittens. This is a video covering everything you need for your second biology exam for edXL. If you want to follow everything along, get loads and loads of keywords because there are so many in biology. Get loads and loads of crosswords for you to help sort stuff out. You can do that by getting my free origin guide which you can download from my website. Photosynthesis is going to take water, carbon dioxide, and turn it into oxygen and glucose. We can take light and we can put it above the equation, but do not put it in the equation because it is not a reactant. It's just a condition that's needed. You also need to know the symbols for these. So water is H2O plus carbon dioxide, which is CO2. Goes to oxygen, O2 plus glucose, which is C6H12O6. This needs to be balanced, but this is a nice easy one to balance because it is 666. So you can just remember that it's 666. And when you're writing out your formula, make sure your numbers are little and are in the correct place. Because if you write this, that's wrong, that's wrong, and you will lose the marks. In photosynthesis, we are taking energy from here, taking energy from light, and we are locking it up in glucose. This is an endo thermic reaction. It takes in energy. There are certain requirements for photosynthesis. First of all, we are going to need chlorophyll. That is our green pigment in leaves. We're going to need water and carbon dioxide because they are our reactants and then we're going to need sunlight. And the levels of these can greatly affect how much photosynthesis takes place. The rate of photosynthesis is going to depend on the percentage level of carbon dioxide. As the percentage level of carbon dioxide increases, so the rate of photosynthesis is going to increase, but only up to a point. After this point, there are going to be other limiting factors. Past this point, we need to increase something like the water, the light, or the temperature if we want more photosynthesis to take place. We could easily switch this out to so percentage level of water, and the graph would look the same. When plants are very, very cold, everything acts very, very slowly. Not a lot happens. It slowly increases until a nice point where the enzymes are happy and there's lots and lots of photosynthesis going on until it gets too hot and they start to be denatured and then the rate will fall off very rapidly. So we have our rate of reaction increasing the temperature and our optimal temperature and our enzymes getting denatured. It's really important that you remember that the enzymes are denatured, they are not killed, they are denatured. Light intensity is important for the rate of photosynthesis. When it is night time, when it is dark, we do not have lots of photosynthesis going on. As we get further through the day, as we get more light intensity, the rate of photosynthesis will increase until we get to a point where it is no longer the limiting factor and other things like the reactants or temperature need to be increased. After this point, we need to think about increasing other things. Now, even though the graph is flat here, it looks like it might have stopped. It hasn't. There is still a steady rate of photosynthesis. It's just not increasing as much as it was down here. It's just a steady rate. The actual um, rate of photosynthesis that takes place is much more complicated than depending on just one thing. It's going to depend on lots of different things all at once. The glucose from photosynthesis is going to be stored as starch. The most obvious example of starch is going to be potatoes. 
here we have a cross section of a typical leaf. Our palisade mesophyll where photosynthesis is going to take place. Cuticle which is the waxy layer. Upper and lower epidermis which cover the plant. Spongy mesophyll which is a space for gas exchange. And the guard cell and stomata which is where transpiration takes place. Inside the plant we have the xylem and the phloem. The phloem is going to carry water. This is generally going to be an upwards direction from the roots where it is collected to the leaves where it can be used for photosynthesis and the phloem which carries ions and food and this is generally in a downwards direction from the leaf where food can be made in photosynthesis to the roots where it can be stored in, for example, potatoes. There are several factors that affect the rate of transpiration and transpiration not only involves water uh, moving out of the stomata but also moving up through the xylem. So if we have bright light that is going to lead to more transpiration. More light means more photosynthesis, which means there's going to need to be more water brought up into the cell. If we have a high temperature, that is going to lead to more transpiration. Because the rate of reaction is going to happen faster. If we have high wind, That is going to lead to more transpiration. Because wind is going to be um, brushing against the leaf or flowing against the leaf, moving things out of the way, so diffusion is going to play a part here. And if we have high humidity, this is going to lead to lower transpiration. Water is going to struggle to leave the leaf because there is a very high concentration of water, it's very humid outside. Here we have the male and female um, endocrine system, the pituitary gland. is in the brain, thyroid, is in the neck the adrenal glands run the kidneys pancreas is hiding behind the stomach ovaries are kind of like hip level and testes hang below the penis the testes produce testosterone which has the effect of um, growing muscles, making the balls and penis drop and grow larger, um, increasing the rate of hair growth. Oestrogen is produced in the ovaries that is responsible for the maturation of eggs and the menstrual cycle. The pancreas produces insulin, which is important for regulating blood glucose levels. The adrenal glands produce adrenaline, which is important for our fight or flight response. The thyroid produces thyroxine, which is important in regulating our metabolism. The pituitary gland is very busy. Among other things, it produces follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, and luteinizing hormone, LH. One of the reasons periods feel so rubbish is because your hormones are literally all over the place. Starting with follicle-stimulating hormone, it rises, peaks, and its job is to make the small egg grow up to a larger egg and then be released. Luteinizing hormone is only active for a very, very short period. Its job is to release the egg. Oestrogen builds up until it stimulates luteinizing hormone. Progesterone builds up slowly as it builds up the lining of the uterus. And if there is no um, egg, uh, if there is no embryo implanted in it, that will de decrease and the lining of the uterus will break down. 
There are a number of different methods of contraception, some hormonal, some non-hormonal, that will stop you getting pregnant. But not all of these will protect against sexually transmitted diseases, so it's always very, very important that you wear a condom. This is a barrier method of contraception. This will stop the sperm getting um, the woman pregnant, and it will also stop the nastiest that are coming between transmitted from her to him or from him to her. The pill and the coil, IUD, into uterine device are hormonal methods of stopping getting pregnant. They are going to stop the egg being released or the egg being implanted. The diaphragm is a barrier method because it will stop sperm entering the vagina, but the um, semen will still be transferred into the um, vaginal entrance so that you can still get sexually transmitted diseases this way. If you're sure that you don't want to have children, you can go to be sterilised, you can have a vasectomy, you can have your tubes tied, which will mean that no sperm will get from the testes out to the penis, or for the woman, no egg will be released. Around one in six people will find themselves in the unfortunate position where they can't have children naturally. About half this is due to male-related reasons and half this is due to female-related reasons. As you can see, I am one of those people, and last year, um, 2016, we did IVF, and this is my massive bump. So the obvious advantages for um, IVF are, you get a baby out of it, um, and if you've been in a situation where you can't have something that you really, really want, you know it's very, very sad and affects your mental health quite a lot. So having a baby is going to be good for people that want to have a baby, their mental health. However, the disadvantages are you have to take a large, large number of drugs for a very, very long period of time. Um, these have very nasty side effects. Um, as well as the daily injections, which leave you horribly bruised. Um, you, um, there are long-term consequences for these. Because um, taking these IVF drugs increases your chance of various different types of cancer. It is very... It's very, very expensive. Um, I had to have it twice, um, that's twice as expensive, doesn't always work. Um, there is about a 40% success rate with IVF, with each round of IVF costing a, a minimum £5,000 um, with a 40% success rate. Here are all the large number of drugs that I have to take day by day. Um, it's a very costly, time-consuming, painful process. We are about halfway through. Well done, guys. We can keep going. We can do this. I just want to say thank you to a few people who have supported me, helped me to add captions to the videos. Captions are going to make your revision so much easier. Beth, Hannah and Nicola have been fantastic in their support and Narinda and Izzy are awesome, awesome teachers who are supporting me as well. Homeostasis is the maintenance of a constant internal environment. And to keep your body functioning properly, we need to control our blood glucose levels, our water levels, and our temperature. The brain is the control center. And that's gonna be sending signals um, to various parts of the body, for example to the pancreas which is responsible for producing insulin. Um, effectors muscles um, are going to do things like moving, for example shivering. And then glands are going to be responsible for the production of other hormones. 
Control of blood glucose is very complicated. After a meal has been eaten, blood glucose levels start to rise. This is picked up by the pancreas. The pancreas produces insulin, which is sent out into the blood. The insulin in the bloodstream is going to cause um, body cells to start to remove glucose from the blood. Liver and muscle cells can take the glucose and convert it into glycogen and store it. Removing glucose from the blood will cause blood glucose levels to fall. If blood glucose levels get too low, this is also picked up by the pancreas. The pancreas will start to produce glucagon. The glucose that has previously been stored in muscle and liver cells starts to return to the blood. The most complicated part of this is getting all the names right. The stored form of glucose is glycogen. Glucagon will convert that into glucose. And this returning of the glucose will cause blood glucose levels to rise again. There are two different types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. In type 1 diabetes, the pancreas doesn't work properly. So it doesn't produce the right amount of insulin. In type 2 diabetes, cells start to become insensitive to insulin. Symptoms for both are going to be a loss of weight. Um, an increased need to wee. Being very thirsty. Blurry vision. Fatigue. So being very sleepy and hunger. Treatment for type 1 diabetes is going to involve insulin injections. Type 2 diabetes, it's going to be controlling diet. Exercise. When we're talking about diffusion, we are talking about things moving from a high concentration down the diffusion gradient to an area of low concentration. This could be things moving from an area inside a cell where they've been made to another area, or it could be things moving out of a cell. For example, it could be um, happening in the lungs, so these are the alveoli, the air spaces, and this is the capillary travelling around it. These are very, very thin, uh, walls only one cell thick, and carbon dioxide is going to diffuse from the blood into the lungs so that it can be breathed out, and oxygen is going to diffuse from the lungs into the blood so it can be taken around the body. All this can be in the gut. These are the villi of the gut. This is the gut cavity here, and you notice again they are one cell thick, and just like the LBO, they have a very large surface area. We're going to get digested food moving from the gut cavity into the blood so that it can be taken around the rest of the body. So diffusion is the movement of gases or any particles that dissolved in solution moving down a concentration gradient from a high concentration to an area of low concentration. Blood is made up of several components. The actual colour of blood is this pale yellow colour. This is the serum, that's the liquid component of the blood. The cells give it its actual colour. Red blood cells, the cells that give blood its colour, have no nuclei. And this is so they have more space to carry oxygen, which is their main function. White blood cells are part of the immune system and platelets are fragments of cells and they are important for things like clotting. 
arteries have a very thick walls because they are carrying blood under high pressure, which means they have a thin lumen. That's the gap in the middle. Capillaries are very, very small. They are only one cell thick, or very, very thin, I should say. They're only one cell thick. This is to allow for diffusion. They generally go around in this kind of like mesh network around things like the gut, around the villi in the gut, around the alveoli in the lungs, so they have a large surface area. The veins carry deoxygenated blood, they carry it back to the heart, so they have valves, and they have thin walls and a thick lumen because they're carrying blood under low pressure. Here we have our respiratory system. Air goes in through the mouth or the nose, down into the trachea, which is also known as the windpipe, then into the bronchus, which is a branch of the trachea, into the bronchioli, which is a branch of the bronchus, and into the little grape or cauliflower-shaped alveoli. This is where gas exchange happens. And they have an incredibly large surface area. Your diaphragm moves up and down to bring air in and out. The heart pumps blood around the body. The intercostal muscles allow the rib cage to expand. And the ribs, the last part that makes up everything, protects the lungs. Here we have a cardiovascular system and it is a double system. The blood gets pumped from the heart to the lungs, goes back to the heart and then gets pumped around the rest of the body. If you see a picture of the heart, the first thing you do is write right and left on there. We have our vena cava where the blood enters. It goes into the right atrium down through a valve into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it goes up and to the lungs via the pulmonary artery. It comes back into the heart via the pulmonary vein, into the left atrium, into the left ventricle, and then is pumped to the rest of the body via the aorta. If you want to check you have the path of blood right, then we need to be looking at capital letters. It goes through the vena cava, the atrium, the ventricle, then the artery, back through the vein, into the atrium, to the ventricle, and then the aorta. So it goes vena cava, atrium, ventricle, artery, vein, atrium, ventricle, aorta, the A-V-A-V-A. -A -A. If you don't have that pattern, you've made a mistake somewhere. Other features of the heart that you need to know are here. These are valves. They will only allow blood to flow. And that this side has a much larger muscle than this side. The right side only needs to pump blood to the lungs, which aren't very far away. But this side has to pump blood to the rest of the body, a much longer distance. The majority of the time, veins carry deoxygenated blood apart from the pulmonary vein, which carries oxygenated blood back into the heart. And the majority of the time, um, arteries carry oxygenated blood apart from the pulmonary vein, which carries deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs. If the heart isn't functioning properly, pacemakers, artificial pacemakers, can be introduced to help the heart keep time. Or if somebody has cardiovascular disease, then these tubes can get blocked up. You are doing such fantastic work. Well done for making it this far. We're just going to take another little mind pause, another little break for you to gather yourself, refresh yourself, and then we're going to start again. For respiration, we are going to take glucose add it to oxygen and come out with water and carbon dioxide. You need to know the symbols for these, so oxygen is O2, water 
H2O, carbon dioxide, CO2, and glucose, C6H12O6. This needs to be balanced, but it's a nice easy one. 6, 6, 6. You have to make sure your numbers are the right size and in the right place. So these ones need to be little numbers and these ones need to be big numbers. Respiration is an exothermic reaction, which means energy is given out. The best example we can see of respiration is screaming jelly baby demo where we take potassium chlorate, that's our liquid oxygen, add in our glucose, that's our jelly baby, and you can see the massive amount of energy that comes off it. Anaerobic means without oxygen. So for anaerobic respiration, we take glucose, and we turn it into energy and lactic acid. Not as much energy as aerobic respiration. because the glucose isn't fully broken down. The lactic acid is going to build up in muscles. Causing an oxygen debt. This build up is going to be quite painful. So you'll get it when you're doing things like sprinting um, or when you run out of oxygen. So after you've finished um, sprinting, after you've finished running to get rid of this oxygen debt, you're going to need to breathe really, really hard. That's why you, you, you pant, you keep breathing hard after you're running to pay back this oxygen debt to get the blood flowing, to remove the lactic acid from your muscles. Anaerobic respiration can also take place in yeast. So yeast will take the glucose and we'll convert it into carbon dioxide and ethanol. Ethanol is used in drinks and cleaning products and carbon dioxide is used for a variety of things but when we talk about uh, in context of yeast that is what's going to make your cakes or your bread rise. An ecosystem are the animals, plants, everything living within a certain area. The community are the plants and animals that live there. And they're all dependent upon one another. They cannot survive without each other. For example, the animals eat the plants. They can't survive without doing that. And the plants rely on the animals to distribute their seeds. To survive and reproduce, a species needs food water, air, and sometimes, but not always, a mate. Abiotic and biotic factors are things that are going to affect any organism. Abiotic are non-living factors, such as light intensity, temperature, Water levels, pH, iron levels, wind, carbon dioxide levels, and oxygen levels.
Biotic factors are going to be living factors such as food, predators, and pathogens. An increase or reduction or removal or introduction of any of these factors can have a dramatic impact on a community. For example, the introduction of a new predator or a new pathogen could wipe out a community. An increase or a decrease in the temperature could mean that the, an organism's food source is gone or an organism can't survive in that environment. And plants and animals aren't going to be able to survive without sufficient levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen. If you want to investigate what grows in a field, you can use a quadrat, which is going to be, um, say, a metre square. You throw that on the ground and count what is in there. Randomly moving it around the field so that you get a wide coverage. You're going to need to estimate the size of the field so that you can work out how much um, area there is. Work out your plant population per area that you've measured and then multiply that up to cover the entire field. A transect is a bit more ordered. You start at a point, take a line, and then take measurements at every single point along that line. Um, this could be, say, from a hedge moving away so that you are varying things like light intensity or distance from water. All the food chains start in the same place with the sun providing energy. And then from this energy, things are going to grow, mainly plants, and they get eaten by other things. Whether it's um, grass being eaten by cows and then going on to be eaten by us, or whether we eat the plants directly, or whether the plants hear the corn is being turned into corn syrup, which is used in ketchup. Whether we eat them directly or process them, we are a top consumer. Whereas other things like cows are going to be herbivores because they just eat plants. The direction of the arrow is really important in food chains. Direction of the arrow means eaten by. Biodiversity is the range of plants and animals that live within a habitat. And humans have a massive impact on biodiversity, whether it is chopping down loads of natural fields so that we can plant the same type of crop over and over again, reducing the biodiversity in that environment because we're replacing it with the same type of crop, or whether we are chopping down fields, forests, so that we can replace it with cities. Microorganisms are part of the system and biotics and abiotic factors that help break down old things, for example, old food so that the components can be recycled back through the system. So for the carbon cycle, I'm referring a lot to organic compounds. And if you haven't heard this phrase before, it can be a bit confusing. Organic compounds are just any compound that has carbon in it. And just to remind you, a compound is two or more elements that are chemically bonded together. So here are all the different locations that carbon can be. It can be carbon dioxide in the air, or carbon dioxide can be dissolved in oceans. It can be as organic compounds in plants or in animals. These organic compounds can also be present in the dead plants and animals, and they are in fossil fuels. Now you need to know the various different ways that they change um, um, from all these different locations and what the processes are called. So let's start with fossil fuels. When we have fossil fuels, we can burn them so that the carbon in them goes into the air. And the fancy name for this is combustion. When the carbon dioxide is in the air, it can be taken up by plants. And this is a process of photosynthesis. And the opposite can occur as well, because plants will also undergo respiration. Plants get eaten by animals. And then plants and animals both die.
from the um, organic compounds that are in the dead um, plants and animals. They can turn into fossil fuels by either either being buried or being sedimented, or they can just go straight back up into the air by the process of decay. And then lastly, our animals are also undergoing respiration. So carbon isn't a static thing. It is constantly moving around from carbon dioxide in the air to carbon compounds that are in animals, plants, in dead animals, and then being inserted into fossil fuels, which can then be burnt and put the carbon dioxide back in the air. This is a very, very complicated, involved process that happens over millions of years, and you need to know all of these steps. The water cycle is much more complicated than you think it is going to be. Heat energy from the sun comes down, warms the surface of the water on the earth, and this is going to cause the water to evaporate. As the water evaporates, it's going to become less dense, it's going to rise up, and then it's going to condense when it starts to cool down. This is when we're going to get clouds formed. When the clouds are heavy, when the water has accumulated so much, it is going to start to rain, and the fancy word for rain is precipitation. After it's rained, the water is going to do a number of things. It can go into the mountains where it will sink in or percolate deep into the mountains where it's then going to pick up stuff like irons, salts, um, which is going to affect the, the taste and the chemistry of the water. This will then come out somewhere as a little stream and go into the river. Some of it's going to go into the soil, moving slowly back towards um, a river or a lake as through flow. Some of the water will go straight onto the ground. If the rock or the mud is already saturated, if it is full of water or the rock is impermeable, then that will just run off into the nearest river or stream or lake or reservoir. All of it ending up at some point in a large collection of water, whether that is in the sea again, or whether that's in a reservoir, or whether that's in a lake. Some of that water will get taken up by plants and used in photosynthesis. It will also come out of plants in a process of transpiration. And then go up into make clouds, and then the cycle can start all over again. The air is about 78% nitrogen, but it is really, really unreactive, so getting it to do anything is tricky. We need to convert the nitrogen into nitrates. This can happen by lightning, by the harbour process, which we'll cover in chemistry. The hub press is used to make fertilisers, which are then put on the ground by nitrifying bacteria. And these nitrifying bacteria are going to be in the root nodules of legumes. So peas, sweet peas we have here, peanuts, stuff like that. These plants then get eaten by animals. 
the animals can then release the nitrogen compounds in either urine or feces, poo, and eventually death as well. We're then going to have denitrifying bacteria which will take the nitrate compounds which are in the soil from the urine, the poo or the death, turn it back into nitrogen gas and release it into the air. Well done guys, excellent work for making it this far. The rest is biology only. So if you're doing combined science, uh, well done, you can go and have a relax or try some quick fire questions or go through the revision guide. Phototrophism means something is going to grow towards the light. Geotrophism or gravitrophism means something is going to grow towards gravity. Meaning your roots are always going to go downwards and your shoots are always going to go upwards. Gibberellins are important for growth. Um, ethene is important for ripening plants and auxins are important for growth and they're going to do growth in the right direction. Body temperature is going to be regulated by the thermoregulatory thermo centre in the brain. If you are too cold, the hairs on your body will stand up. This is to trap a layer of air. You're going to stop sweating. Vasoconstriction will start. So your blood vessels will constrict so that they're further away from the skin. Less blood is going to flow close to the surface of the skin, so less heat is going to be lost from it. And your muscles are going to start to shiver, and movement is going to produce energy. If you are too hot, your hairs are going to lie flat, so they're not trapping any air. You're going to start sweating. And the water is going to evaporate, leading to heat and energy loss. And your blood vessels are going to undergo vasodilation, meaning they are going to get wider so that blood can flow closer to the surface of the skin so that heat can be lost. The kidneys have three functions. They remove urea. They control the iron content and they control the water content of the blood. There are three ways we can lose um, water from our body. In urine, in sweat and when we breathe out. It's important to control the level of water in the body because there is, there's too much water, it's too much water taken up by cells by osmosis and they might pop or if there's not enough water then the enzymes, the functions, the reactions won't be able to take place. There are three steps to the way that the kidneys function, ultrafiltration, reabsorption and then the release. Blood enters the kidneys under high pressure and water, ions, urea and sugar are going to be squeezed out into the capsule, which is at the start of the nephron. As this all flows along the nephron, useful things are reabsorbed. 
All of the sugar is going to be absorbed via active transport. Some ions, the amount of ions that we need, the type of ions that we need, are going to be reabsorbed by active transports. And enough water that we need is going to be reabsorbed. The hormone that controls how much water is going to be absorbed is ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone. And then anything that isn't reabsorbed is going to come out as we. If kidneys aren't working properly, a person can undergo kidney dialysis. The dialysis machine will take over the function of the kidneys, but it is very time-consuming, it takes about four hours and has to be done three times a week. So this has a huge impact on someone's life and is not a lot of fun. An alternative to dialysis could be a kidney transplant, but these come with very long waiting lists and there is always the risk of rejection. When we are looking at food chains, we can also think about constructing pyramids, either pyramids of numbers or pyramids of biomass. Each of these are trophic levels, and when we're doing numbers, you just need to look at the number of things that eat the thing below it. And biomass, we need to take into account the number and the mass of the stuff that's being eaten. As we jump between trophic levels, roughly 10% of energy is transferred from one to the other. It is going to be lost in a number of different ways. Respiration. Waste, as in um, urea and faeces. Movement, running around, jumping, doing normal animal things. Food security is how sure that we are going to have food on our table. So how are we sure we are that our supermarkets are going to be full of things for us to buy? If as a country we don't produce much of our own food, we have to buy it in from other places. Which means we depend on other countries, other people's climates, trade agreements with these other countries and transport arrangements, getting the food across borders. Increasing our own food production in this country will ensure our food or help to ensure our food security. If we are producing our own food, we're not reliant on other people. We need to take into account ways to increase yields, for example using fertiliser, but then we also need to take into account the impact that will have on the wider environment. And we need to take into account production methods. Are they land intensive? Are they good for the environment or not? As we are on an island, sustainable fishing is one way we can help to secure our food security. But we need to take into account things like net size. Are we catching fish before they are too old, before they've had a chance to reproduce? Are we catching too many? Do we maybe need to move to lion court fish so we don't catch endangered species? And we need to look at fisheries quotas. We can also look at new ways of developing food, for example, culturing microorganisms, which we can use as a food source. Decay and decomposition are breaking down of organic matter, and this generally happens by microorganisms. Our microorganisms are alive, and this is what we need to think about when we are looking at how temperature, water, and oxygen affect the levels of decay. They are not going to work at very, very low temperatures. They are going to have a rather narrow set of temperatures which they're going to want to work in. They rely on enzymes to break things down. They are going to slowly be increasing their, um, how, how well they work as the temperature increases. But then at a certain point, the enzymes are going to nature, so it's going to come quite steeply down. And if it gets too hot, the whole thing's going to catch on fire. Very similar with the level of water, it's going to be slowly increasing as it gets uh, wetter. And then past a certain point, the bacteria just aren't going to be able to cope. They need to have oxygen. They need to be able to respire. And if there's too much water, they just can't do that. Oxygen, there is a very narrow amount of oxygen that they will be able to use. Um, without oxygen, they can't do anything. And too much oxygen, then it starts to become toxic. In the garden, gardeners can compost things so that they can get rid of their um, unwanted things and then take the nutrients, the goodies in there and put them back onto the garden. Compost is going to get rather hot as this goes on and it's going to get rather smelly and gas is going to be released. And this gas can be harvested and used.